and welcome back. And today we're working on this beast right here. This is a Bendix G15, a legitimate vacuum tube computer from the 1950s, and it is on loan from System Source Museum up in Maryland. And if you haven't heard of System Source, go check them out immediately. Bob has just one of the greatest museums in the country. He's got a whole cadre of IBMs, a Xerox Alto, a bunch of really cool mini computers, even a Lino type. And he fires a lot of them up and lets people experience these machines like they're meant to be used. And well, Bob is also just an absolute legend. So if you're anywhere in the area, even if you're not anywhere in the area, go check out System Source. It is absolutely worth the visit. It is a bucket list level museum. And Bob very kindly sent this G15 down here to Texas so we could get it up and running. And once it's running, it's going straight back up to System Source to go on display there. And I cannot wait for that because this thing is just stunning to see in person. And if it were working and running, it would just be a once in a lifetime experience. And so that's our goal, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to build that experience for people at System Source Museum. And I think we're gonna get there. So far, we've done uh, just a lot of fact finding and a whole lot of cleaning. Uh, and I gotta say, this thing cleaned up really well. I can't take credit, it was preserved really well. And I've seen a bunch of uh, G15s in person now, and this is by far and away the cleanest one I've ever seen. But we still have a little more cleaning to do. Uh, the very center on the inside, I haven't gotten to yet. So we need to do a bit more cleaning on that. And we have one big job that we have to tackle today. That is the rotating drum memory. In the previous episode, we actually pulled the cover off of the rotating drum and took a look at it and found that it had multiple head crashes. Looking closer, it looks like there was some water intrusion onto the drum, which may have caused some water spots or even some mold to grow. And the clearance between the heads and the drum is only one thousandth of an inch. That's 0.02 millimeters. Uh, and the heads are fixed. So if the drum expands a little bit and uh, there is some water spots or mold taking up that distance, it can just cause the heads to run into the drum, which will chew off magnetic material and make the drum unusable. And that's what happened here. So we were kind of trying to figure out where to go next with it. And I do want to try and recoat this drum in the future. And I have a pretty good plan in place for how to do that. But in the interest of actually getting this machine up and going a little quicker, I am instead going to pull the drum out and swap it with the drum from Bob's second G15, which is currently on display at the museum. And we're gonna take that drum, which is not crashed, and put it into this machine. But in order to do that swap, I have to get this drum out of this machine first, so I can take it up to Maryland with me next month. So we got a ton of work to do, a little bit of cleaning, and a lot of wrenching on the bottom half here. This is something that I don't think anybody's done in decades. So there's gonna be a lot of, uh, figuring things out the hard way. But I think we can get it out, and once we get it out, we can take a really good look at it. So, let's get to work. First things first, let's get to cleaning. And we'll start with these big variable power resistors down here on the bottom. These things are awesome looking, but they are a nightmare to clean. The little shop towel just got torn all to shreds while trying to get in and around these things. I'll also give these massive power cables a quick wipe down too. I'm pretty sure these are the 6.3 volt AC power cables for the filaments. That's really the only thing I can think of that would need that insane amount of current capability. Next, let's get to cleaning up these tubes. And these tubes are on the relay and driver chassis, and they are the only ones on the entire machine that haven't been cleaned yet. And it's easy to overlook, but uh, V1 through V5 here are tucked up underneath the corner. Uh, but we definitely want to get these two because they are all really gross. So I'll just give them a good wipe down with a little shop towel soaked in water. Uh, and it really didn't take much for these to clean up really nicely. Uh, next, let's get these big relays out so we can give them a proper clean as well. They're held in with a retaining plate and a screw, but with those removed, they just pull right out. They uh, plug into sockets that are very similar to vacuum tube sockets, actually. Uh, anyways, I'll give them a bit of a scrub, and they actually took a little more elbow grease than I was expecting to get clean, but they did shine up really nicely. And looking closer, these appear to be Sigma-made single-pole dual-throw relays, 
and the part number is 4R200S-SIL, whatever that means. Uh, anyways, finally, let's give the relay and driver chassis itself a proper and nice wipe down. But actually, that raises a good question. What is this relay and driver chassis for? Well, if we look at the power supply schematic here, we can actually see a little bit of that on here. There, it says relay chassis right here, and you can see it holds a bunch of relays. Uh, really, the power supply is fantastically complex, but the important thing to note here is that it sequences power in a very specific order so that you can bring things up in a sequential manner. And so all of that sequencing control is on the relay and driver chassis. Uh, and we can actually see the sequencers over here on the right, but uh, we can also see those sequencers on the chassis itself inside of the machine uh, right here. So it's a pretty wild collection of stuff to get the power supply going. And when we get to the point of bringing up AC and DC, we're gonna dive very heavily into this. But that's not the only thing on that chassis. If we look at this schematic page here, it says relay chassis logic section. Uh, and you can see it's the vacuum tubes that we cleaned up, uh, V1 through V12, it looks like. Uh, these are all dual triodes, and they're just using them as drivers for uh, exiting the machine. You can see some of them have a card punch signal, card read signal. We've got uh, TB1, AD, AB, whatever those go to, I have no clue. But they're all taking signals from within the machine and providing a driver interface to signals that need to leave the machine. Uh, now, interestingly, V1 through V5 have a little star next to them, and it says needed only if CA1 accessory is used. And if we look through one of the uh, brochures that we've come across, we can see that the CA1 is a punched card coupler. Uh, now, they have this awesome photo of this really cool uh, punch reader machine, but that's not actually the CA1. The CA1 is just the coupler box that's sitting on the back. It's not even hardly shown in this picture. Uh, the rest of this awesome big machine is all an IBM Model 026 card reader punch. Uh, so the CA1 that Bindix sold was just a little interface to go between the IBM reader punch and the machine. And within the machine, you have the interface tubes that are driving the signals that go to this. Uh, now the IBM 026 card reader punch can read at a rate of 17 columns per second and uh, punched at a rate of 11 columns per second. So you can actually get quite a lot of uh, programming into the machine via one of these. And I can definitely see why somebody would want one of these. And that makes sense that it was actually built into the Bendix itself. The uh, punch tape reader on the front is gonna be fantastically slow compared to this. And I imagine a lot of people had uh, programs on punch cards back in the day. So that's all built into the machine. It's ready to interface to the coupler, which is ready to interface to one of these machines already. So you just need to buy the coupler separate and you're good to go. At any rate, with all the tubes installed back in place, the center area of the machine cleaned up really well. And that relay and driver chassis looks absolutely gorgeous. Everything looks really nice and shiny. And I can't wait to see it doing all of its power on sequencing stuff. That's gonna be epic to watch. All right, I gotta take a quick break from cleaning right quick to talk about this panel because this is one of my favorite features in the whole machine. This is a breakout panel for your scope, so you can check pretty much everything vital to the machine right here. Uh, you can see that there's a jack here for your scope signal, for your trigger, for your ground. You can check the minus 20 volts to make sure that it's on correctly. You have a DC lockout. And then what you do is you plug your scope signal into here, your trigger signal into here, and your ground into here. And you can choose where those connect onto this little plug board here. So this little plug here is connected directly to this scope signal. And I can plug it into say uh, NT up here, which is the number track. And then I can choose to trigger off of, oh, I don't know, T1CN. And so it's going to trigger off of T1CN and we're gonna be able to see on the scope what our number track is doing based on that trigger. And we can do other interesting Interesting things like uh, M19 and M23 are uh, fairly vital tracks and we can either uh, 
clear them or set them with these buttons here. So that's really cool. Also, you can uh, take your scope signal, plug it into this spot here that's blank, and that's actually connected up to this little probe here, which has a whole lot of wire with it. So I can run this over to the door plug it into a specific pin, and then check that pin on that card without ever having to move my scope. This is really awesome, especially when you consider that scopes back in the 50s weighed about 70 pounds, like the HP 150A that I have. So when using that scope with this machine, this little breakout panel is gonna be awesome. Next, let's get to work on removing the drum itself. There's a little rubber coupler that goes between the motor shaft and the drum shaft, and it has these little Allen key locking bolts. So I'll just uh, contort my arm into that tight little space and break those loose with a little Allen key. Uh, but this coupler has been on there for like 60 plus years, so it's going to need a little persuasion to break loose. So I took a block of wood and set it down in there so I had something to pry against. Then I took a big old screwdriver and really hoisted on it and <laughs> problem solved. It cracked loose. Uh, next up, the drum assembly is bolted to the base of the machine with four giant bolts. I need to get a wrench onto the bottom and a ratchet on the top, which is not easy given how little space there is, but doable. And once the bolt is cracked loose, I can spin the nut off the bottom and push the bolt up and through. And then I just have to snake my arm down into the bowels of the machine and grab the bolt and pull it out. Uh, with all four bolts removed, the drum is nearly ready to come out. I just need to disconnect these two massive cannon connectors for the read and write heads. And with those disconnected, it's now time to slowly walk the drum out. It was precisely engineered to have the exact amount of room necessary to remove the drum without having to remove the transformers or the reed amplifiers next to it. The main drum shaft just barely slides between the coils and core on the transformer. It's really awesome. But despite its heftiness, it slid straight out the front and onto the ground with ease. With the drum out of the way, now is an excellent time to clean up the bottom of the machine since I can now get to a lot more places. I'll vacuum up all of the excess chad that has fallen down here from the paper tape punch. Uh, then I'll spray down some Windex and get to scrubbing. And it's really wild to see the original turquoise blue color come shining right back after all these years and all those layers of grime and muck. And not even 30 minutes of scrubbing later, it was absolutely worth the effort. It looks absolutely beautiful in here. So next, let's crack this drum open. And we need to get the head cover panel off first, and there are three screws holding that uh, panel on. After removing those, we'll remove the two screws on the cable retaining plate. Then that plate just slides out of the way, and the whole head cover can come right off giving us a look at the madness that is the uh, read and write heads on this machine. There's one more piece that we can move on the backside of the drum though. It's a giant plastic cover held on with 12 little screws. And with all 12 screws removed, it just cracks loose from the original cork gasket and comes right off, giving us our first proper look at the drum itself and you can really see just how badly crashed it was. And looking closer at the surface, there is definitely evidence of water intrusion, little black spots, water spots, and all sorts of other nastiness on the surface of the drum that could easily crash the heads. I'll give it a wipe down with alcohol and a microfiber cloth. This is what we use to clean hawk platters, so it should be totally fine here. And while it definitely did clean up all the gunk, it mostly just confirms that the stripes that look like head crashes definitely indeed are head crashes. Well, we got the drum out and pretty far apart, as far apart as I'm going to take it at the moment, at least. And man, I, I wish I could convey smell to you over video because this thing is an assault on the senses. It weighs a ton. It has this unbelievable feel across the surface. Also, by the way, if your drum is not crashed, don't ever touch it with your fingers. This one's already muntered, so we're going to 
we don't care that much about it. But the smell, the smell of 60 year old electronics is unmistakable. And this thing is emanating a smell that you just can't put into words. Uh, anyways, now that we've got it apart, we can really see how bad the drum is. Uh, it's not flaking or falling apart or the, the magnetic material isn't coming off, but it was a really bad head crash. Uh, looking closely at the drum before I uh, cleaned it off a little bit, you could definitely see some water spots and some gunk and stuff on there. So I'm like 90% certain that that's what happened. There was some water ingress and uh, that closed up the gap between the drum and the heads and it crashed. Another interesting thing I learned though was that this cover here, which sits right on the backside here, was coated in some kind of grease on the inside. Now I cleaned most of it out because gross, it's like it was disgusting. Uh, but all I can think about that grease being is that it was put there at the factory to be a dust trap because as this thing spins around, it's going to fling any dust kind of out and away and then this thing could catch it. And the fact that this is a nice, easily removable plastic piece with a uh, cork seal here, kind of tells me that maybe this was part of routine maintenance on this thing, that you would pull the grease trap off, clean the grease out, put new grease in and put it back in. But you have to be really careful how thick you put the grease on there. It has to be an incredibly thin layer and it has to be really sticky grease because none of it can touch the drum itself. That was a really interesting, fascinating find that I didn't think about, but well, at the end of the day, we still have a crashed drum. You can see the grooves on this thing are pretty, pretty bad. And if you run your finger across it, you can actually feel unevenness in the drum itself. I can feel the waviness from the crashes and that should be perfectly smooth. That should be so smooth that it's imperceptible to the touch. Uh, so it's been destroyed enough to the point that this drum will never read again as it sits, which leads us nicely into the quest of how do we fix this drum and get it going again. Well, as I said earlier, the, the plan is to uh, take this up to Baltimore with me and uh, swap it out with the drum that is in the G15 that's on display. It doesn't look like it's had a crash. It looks like it's in pretty good shape. Now, once this machine is up and running, I do wanna take a swing at recoding this drum. And that brings us to how on earth do you recoat a drum? If we're talking about how to coat something like a platter for something like the Hawk Drive here, you know, things that look a bit like this, these are all crashed. Don't worry about me touching them. <laughs> They're all heavily crashed. But if we're talking about how to coat a platter like this, IBM famously would uh, mount it perfectly level, spin it up to a high speed, and then drip the goop on there. Uh, then the force of it spinning would uh, level out that uh, material on there to a perfectly flat finish. Now, something like the Hawk, the heads fly about 50 times closer to the surface of the disc than the heads on this drum do. So there is a little bit difference in manufacturing technique. Also, the fact that this is a drum means that we can't use IBM's technique there. So we're going to have to come up with some way to recoat the drum, and that is an interesting challenge. The number one comment or suggestion that I got about this in the previous episode was to maybe wrap the drum in some kind of magnetic tape, like VHS tape or uh, cassette tape or reel-to-reel -reel tape or something like that. And I don't think that'll work, not from an electrical standpoint, but from a mechanical standpoint. Electrically, yes, I'm sure that the read-write heads on here can flip bits and read those flipped bits back off of that kind of tape. But mechanically, I don't think we can make it work. This drum rotates at 30 revolutions per second. And given the diameter of the drum, that means that the surface speed of the drum out here is like 70 miles per hour. Uh, so the wind force on here is gonna be ridiculous because anytime you have a large amount of mass moving at speed, it's going to drag wind along with it. And then of course, that surface has to fly right past all of the heads. So it's gonna be extremely turbulent right through that area. And we have 
a thousandth of an inch of clearance, 0.02 millimeters of clearance. There's just absolutely no space in there. So something like tape, you can't really wind it in such a way that you get perfect run out and strength to withstand that amount of turbulent forces swinging past the heads. You would have to find some way to actually adhere every possible square inch of tape to the drum itself smoothly and perfectly. And uh, there's just too many ch engineering challenges involved in that, I think, for it to be doable. You know what, I think our best chance is going to be actually recoding the drum. So here's my plan on how to recoat this. You guys can get in the comments and absolutely disagree and tell me how much of an idiot I am, but I wanna give the redneck try a swing first, and when that fails, we'll go on to more scientific methods. But drums were originally spray coated. We actually found some evidence of this in old patents. Spraying down a material is something that's been known and perfected over many years in the automotive industry for spraying paint. If we can get something like 2K clear coat, that's our non-ferrous material in our binder. Then we just need to mix in some kind of ferrous material that can flip bits. We'll just mix in maybe some red iron oxide until it looks about right. So the actual process that I'm thinking is remove the drum, mount it on the lathe, machine the surface of the drum back to perfect aluminum, spray down a high build primer, let the primer fully cure, machine the primer down to a perfect finish with perfect run out. I mean, it's gotta be absolutely flawless run out. Uh, and then we will spray on our 2K clear with ferrous oxide mixture while rotating the drum at a set speed and spraying for a set amount of time. This will lay down a very specific amount of material and then the 2K clear coat is self leveling. So it should level to a perfect finish. If it doesn't, we have a couple other options that we can try. One of them is squeegeeing. So you spray down the material and then you uh, bring a squeegee in at the exact distance you want it to be and keep it rotating until it squeegees out to be a perfect finish. But I think if we just spray it with some nice 2K clear with ferrous oxide, uh, red iron oxide mixed in, I think we can get there. But let's all keep in mind that this is massively in the future. It's after we get that machine up and running and executing code. That is top priority. That's where we're going next, is we're gonna load this thing up in the car, we're heading all the way up to Maryland where I'm gonna hang out at System Source Museum again, and I'm gonna get a lot more footage while I'm there, so you guys can expect to see a bunch more about that. And also, it's gonna be really fun hanging out on a museum floor, pulling out a... <laughs> piece of irreplaceable history to take back in the car with me. So that's going to be an extremely fun journey, and I hope you guys are looking forward to it because I am extremely excited about it as well. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.